womb and I want to empower us in some way. And I'm not really. Exhibit where those students read a poem by Eleanor Eliasson, and he has done a lot of climate change work. He brings uh, uh, iceberg pieces of icebergs that have broken off from Greenland. He's taken it to the COP uh, conferences about climate change and uh, allows people to actually touch a melting uh, piece of ice. And he believes that no one gets what a glacier is. And so he, he it, and then it, it melts in front of your eyes. And this is like, like, I mean, what is really happening? And then this, are you even going to get the touch of before it goes away? But his poem is about, uh, we have to remember we are the earth. We're part of the earth. And that's what my students did. So they went and they brought photos. They took photos from different parts of campus or, or in their homes. And you know, look, they were talking things about remember that we are we, we're creating our life. We have some power to make the earth the way we want it to be in our own lives. And hopefully it's inspirational when you go look at what they've chosen and the lines from the poem of Eliasson. Um, and then the second one is um, maybe a little more negative. And I was wanting to read Chance and Daniel's comments. Can I take a little bit here? So okay. I'm gonna get up to six minutes. Okay. <laughs> so um with the, our students in the digital studio uh read an, an article uh in the New York Times that was a, a, last year came out. It was it called A Day Without Plastic. And why I wanted them to read that is it was funny. And how often do you read a climate article that makes you laugh while you're reading it? And so then after they read it, they are offering some solutions, but they're also um taking ownership of the fact that we all um, have to use plastic and to stop using it is a real problem. So I'm just going to read, uh, Daniel says, in today's society, plastic consumption and usage is inevitable. I think that's absolutely true, right? Almost everything we come in contact with contains some form of plastic, whether it is our clothing, shoes, food, products, and even healthcare products. Although plastic is essentially unavoidable, the biggest change that I can make to reduce the amount of plastic consumption is using single-use plastic products like this coffee cup. So if you go to the exhibit, you'll see he's got a photo of, of the coffee cup. He says, because this is no reuse, the amount of plastic adds up in an exponential rate. At least reusable plastics can be prolonged and do not pile up. I'm gonna jump to a uh, chance Plastics are all around us and everyone uses something of plastic each day. And then he's choosing AirPods because they are, to me, the exception when it comes to plastic use. I've had these for two years and they're still working well. The goal of plastic should be to utilize objects made of plastic that also have longevity. And he says more, and you need to go over to the exhibit and uh, read the rest of what he says. But they're both saying to, uh, saying we have a, a lobe now the plastic helps us in so many ways it's lightweight it doesn't break in the way that you know glass could replace but if some if you drop a glass container it shatters it's dangerous um uh so you know i think they are a representative of that class understanding that we can't get rid of plastic but uh, okay we can't get rid of <laughs> Plastic, but we should think about not using single use plastic. And I'm sorry, my my comic book creation students that go see their cartoons well as well. So I could speak next. Um, I think I was thinking of this in a, a sort of similar way to Mitch in the sense of um, thinking a little bit about history and how art and the environment or art and climate have been or could be related. I had a, a couple different thoughts that I was hoping to share, but I think I'll maybe just sort of focus on one uh, sort of idea. Um, and I guess I would say that uh, sort of building off a little bit of what Mitch was saying, I think coming out of the Industrial Revolution, you know, I think for people to know about uh, climate change and greenhouse gas effect kind of 
changes to the environment that we sort of know about and talk about today, I think wasn't something people were aware of. But I do think people for a really long time have known about uh, the Industrial Revolution and, and factories as being this thing that is creating huge amounts of pollution, sort of destroying the environment. Right. There's other kinds of uh, things happening too, right? Involving, say, in America, you know, deforestation uh, is kind of a big thing. I know, and I'll talk about this maybe uh, towards the end, but I really like this area and, and how naturally beautiful it is. If you go into the woods here, it's very, very, very rare that you're going to find woods in a forest or really anywhere that are uh, trees, I should say, that are over maybe 100 years old, right? Um, so everything in this area has been completely cut down and, and used for lumber and timber, you know, mining, factories, that kind of pollution has really been a, a huge concern for hundreds of years at this point. Um, so what I just wanted to talk about was one of the first times in art history that artists started to look at the environment and look at nature and say, this is this like really, really beautiful thing that we need to appreciate and preserve, I think happens with sort of the rise of landscape painting. And so landscape painting has been around for longer than this, but there was a long time where it was not appreciated as sort of a, a major sort of genre of art, right? It was sort of always thought of as a lesser sort of practice that you do this as practice to be able to then have a scene where there's a story happening you know, it's a scene from the Bible, or it's a scene from our, you know, Roman or Greek history uh, or mythology. Um, and that that was sort of maybe more the end goal of art, the storytelling. And so there was this shift that happened in the 1800s where artists started to make paintings that were just landscapes. And really then I think you could say they're a celebration of the natural beauty of the world. And there were some, you know, sometimes religious connotations to that of saying, you know, look at, this is sort of God's domain and, and look at the power of uh, divinity, right? As opposed to thinking that humans and human solutions to whatever problems we're imagining are kind of the, the end all be all. Um, part of the, the reason I thought this would be appropriate to talk about is mm -hmm. there is uh, a movement of painting that's called the Hudson River Valley School of Painting. Um, that really started in uh, New York State, but is really um, thought of as something that is the entire country, right? So uh, locally, we have the Arnett Art Museum that has paintings by some of the famous uh, Hudson River Valley School painters, including uh, Thomas Cole and uh, Albert Beardstadt. There are also in Elmira are paintings by Thomas Moran. And uh, the direction I wanted to go is just to say Thomas Moran was a, a painter who went on a trip out west when that was sort of new territory, right, 1800s, and people didn't really know about it. It was sort of at the same time that photography had just sort of recently been invented and still was not very popular, not used very much. And so he went on this expedition and did these paintings of the American West of places like the Grand Canyon. And when he came back, displaying those paintings as well as, you know, the photographs that were taken by other artists uh, during that exhibition were directly responsible for the creation of the national park system. So I think um, a lot of the, the positive things I think about our area are its natural beauty. And there's so many sort of state parks, state forests, uh, privately funded um, and, you know, sort of publicly supported uh, natural preserve, nature preserves, natural kinds of sites uh, in our area. And I think those are really important because they do sort of help preserve the land. They protect it from things like mining and logging and exploitation of natural resources. Uh, but the other thing that they do is if we can go and visit and appreciate those places and realize, oh, you know, we don't just live in cities. We live on the earth. We live in sort of sync with nature. And this is this really important, beautiful thing that we need to preserve. I think that is uh, a really important part of our society. So I just thought that's a little sort of a story of how landscape painting uh, to 
Hudson River Valley School to the creation of the National Park System sort of impacts our lives and is really something that we see in our uh, local area. One last thing I could sort of mention as a tangent, um, even specific to the college, uh, we did have an artist, um, a local artist named George Waters, who was sort of part of that tradition of the Hudson River Valley School painting uh, school. I think I said that wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to know the uh, George Waters Gallery, where we're having our student show opening tomorrow night from five to seven, is um, named after him. And he was a, a professor here. And there are a lot of his uh, paintings that are in the area that you can see, including some uh, at the Arnold Park Museum. Um, so I'm just pulling together, trying to play out some of the concepts and ideas that um, the other panelists have, panelists have presented. And as opposed to history, I'm going to bring us right to the moment um, because uh, representing a community arts center um, is very much in the moment every day. Um, we not only respond to community needs in terms of classes and exhibitions, programming, but we also listen to the community. And I think one thought that has come across today is that we all are one. We are one together as people and we are together as one with, the, with nature. And so um, the idea of climate change and how can I help change, make change and not be overwhelmed and not feel as if uh, doom and gloom is circulating over our heads is to work together. That's how community arts approaches it. And I see that that's how artists, creatives from painters, photographers, fiber artists across the fields in, in art, uh, individually in their studios, but also when they pull together and try to send um, a message of working together and making change uh, really empowers people to feel that they are making change. And one of the times that community arts in particular uh, tried to make that community change is with a uh, plastic ocean pro uh, project. And later you can learn more about that on your phones. But uh, a woman who was originally from Elmira, Bonnie Holden Monte Leon, became a professor and began this project in North Carolina. And the project, um, Plastic Ocean Project, is dedicated to ending the plastic pollution crisis through research, outreach, and collaborative solutions. And again, instead of solutions, whatever you're most comfortable with as a creative action, uh, collaboration. And we partnered with Tanglewood Nature Center and Museum. So um, looking not just what people can do, but what people can do in conjunction with nat the natural environment and people who represent that too. Um, uh, several Elmira College students contributed to that exhibition and um, along the way uh, learned some interesting facts, which many of you already might be familiar with, but that um, from plankton to blue whales, um, you know, wildlife ingests plastic. Okay, and talking in terms of the ocean, there's nothing in the ocean that is not impacted by plastic, but we too, right? We are all one and humans. I, do, I can't quote the percentage of what we ingest is plastic that will never leave your body, but it's, <laughs> my, yes, uh, the microplastic levels um, are, are, are present uh, here today with us. Um, there were 600 power outages in one year in California alone from mylar balloons. That's one thing is if you're part of organizations, not-for-profits, groups, um, grassroots, Community Arts of Elmira was a grassroots movement. Take these ideas back to those organizations. You don't have to serve on boards. It's not hierarchical. Again, we are all one. Take these ideas back and implement them. Challenge your organizations. No plastic. We changed it after Bonnie came through. We went through our kitchen and eliminated all plastics. Uh, single use. Uh, it's it, You matter as students to, to these types of movements and to climate change and to plastics in your removing plastic, for example, in your own communities. Um, another aspect I'd like to bring up uh, to respond more during your questions and answers is that um, artists do feel the pinch of scarcity and what they create based on what they can afford to purchase for studio supplies. Um, so I do see 
um, incredible uh, impacts in terms of artists making fewer smaller items from upcycled, recycled material, or at least material that does not, to the degree that others do, harm themselves and harm the earth. I see artists taking more preventative steps in wearing uh, protective gear when they're using chemicals, um, uh, so, uh, materials with chemicals. Uh, um, we had created a, a program for the community, free and open to the community, called Buttons and Bobbins, which not just teaches people not only to sew, but sew with machines, so that we make an impact on the toss away disposable, you know, more than affordable clothing, but clothing that is not designed to last, clothing that contributes to the landfills. And so by teaching the community for free on multiple machines monthly, how to mend, how to repair, how to value what you buy because you can repair it. We will teach you how to repair. We have also started because of that in the past year an uh, atelier, which is an even greater studio space for a community to come and learn to create their own fashions as well as to just mend and repair and give more thought to what goes into not only what they're eating and how they're ingesting it, but what they're wearing and how they're purchasing, what their consumption is as artists, because we want to be the model for people to say, how do I help change? How do I not feel so overwhelmed by climate change and the impact that is having? Period. Are there any other thoughts you guys want to elaborate on? I was going to say, I have a, a little bit of statistics about the plastic, just because this is the article my students read. Uh, it says here that according to the Pew Charitable Trust, more than 11 million metric tons of plastic enter oceans each year, leaching into the water, disrupting the food chain and choking marine life. We also watched Chris Jordan's film on um, Midway Island where the albatross babies, mother, the mother, and maybe father albatrosses would feed plastic to the babies. Then he photographed the, the albatross cut open with all of the plastics inside because they died. Um, close to one fifth of plastic waste gets burned, releasing CO2 into the air, according to the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which also reports that only 9% of plastics are recycled. Some aren't economical to recycle, and other types degrade in quality when they are. Plastic may harm our health. Certain plastic additives, such as BPA and phthalates, may disrupt the endocrine system in humans, according to the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Worrying effects may include behavioral problems, lower testosterone levels in boys, and lower thyroid and hormone levels in preterm births for women. Uh, and I think maybe some of your other classes, you might have heard about the microplastics and endocrine our bodies uh, that we don't even realize that. I mean, we're talking, my class was really looking at like the plastic on our phone and the plastic in our shoes, but we don't even think about if we drink water that we might be drinking microplastics. Yeah, and I just wanted to build off the point that you were making at the end of your presentation that, I mean, I think we think of the climate issue, the climate crisis issue, right, as how can we fix the environment, right? How can we repair the environment, right? You know, when really I think it's fundamentally, you know, a cultural and social issue, right, of how we live our modern lives. And, and what's really interesting to me is that it seems like we're at a crisis point anyway in our society. If you look at uh, surveys about people's happiness, <laughs> right? Uh, people are not very happy about the environment. They're not happy about the politics. They're not happy about foreign policy, right? The, the civilization that we live in, right, seems to be failing and not really serving the greater majority of the people that live in it. Um, and yet this is the system that is destroying the environment, right? Um, and so it's a perfect opportunity to rethink how we live our lives. I mean, and I think we're all going to arrive at that point soon where we realize that's what we need to do. I was going to say, um, kind of relating again back to, to what Mitch sort of started our, our discussion with uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution. I, I think we can really think about art as being a 
product. And I think that can be really dangerous, right? That it's this thing that the only goal of art is to make an object that you sell and then maybe make as many objects as you can to sell as many as you can to make as much money as you can so you can buy someone else's products. And it's this sort of vicious circle. Um, and I think there is a different idea of art that's a little bit maybe more closely related to what Lynn was talking about and sort of um, some of the goals of community arts. Um, and so I was thinking about there was an artist who I saw a lecture by uh, a number of years ago named uh, Pedro Reyes, who's a, a Mexican artist. And I thought this project that he did was um, a kind of astounding idea. So uh, he was from a, an area in Mexico where there was a lot of uh, gang and, and gun violence, and it was a, a real problem, as I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard about, is sort of something that is uh, still really very prevalent in parts of Mexico. And so what he did is he had, and this is something that, you know, it's not painting, right? It's not um, exactly sculpture. It's, it's something that you might call social practice instead. Um, and so what he did is he had this community-wide event where he said, you know, if you have a gun, right, that it's like something that you want to get rid of and you want to sort of remove guns from this community, you can bring them to this event and just give them, you know, get rid of them. And it doesn't matter if they're, you know, illegal, unregistered firearms, whatever it was. So people did that and then they got all of these guns. And then what they did is they took those guns and they melted them down into just the steel and they cast them as shovel heads. And then they made shovels out of those, you know, pieces of metal that were from guns. And then they had an event where they uh, got a bunch of community members together again, and they planted trees using those shovels. So in one way, that's a sort of a very symbolic thing. And that's, you know, I don't think something that you could do that exact thing everywhere in the world every, you know, year, and it would be, have that kind of success. Um, but I thought that was an example of rather than going out and getting these, you know, certain materials and buying them sort of raw, right? It's more that idea of, of sort of recycling material. And it's a way of kind of um, engaging the community, you know, maybe sort of improving the lives of people in the community. And also it did have that connection towards trying to improve the world and better the environment by planting trees. So I thought that was kind of an extraordinary um, project. And, you know, it's, it's maybe doesn't sound quite the same, but I, I do think uh, some of the things that uh, organizations like community arts uh, do, do help uh, push some of those ideas forward in a similar way. And what you do locally can be extraordinary. I agree 100% that was, that project was, it was amazing, but you all are amazing too. You're here today, you're thinking, you're considering um, how you can make a difference. And, um, and it's not just, it's, it's not just art. Um, for Earth Day, the Southern Pier Tobacco Coalition asked to partner with Community Arts of Elmira because they really wanted to send a message about the cigarette butts that were three inch deep in some parts of the city, but in some parts, but they were everywhere in the community, not just in, in certain um, neighborhoods and districts. And so we did partner um, with them and from that community collection, anyone in the community was welcome to come and collect the cigarette butts. And then those who wanted to could turn them into messages of creativity uh, that we too then put in an exhibition. Um, and so for the community to see themselves as creatives and as artists too, with no training, no experience, but with concern for our local community and the fact that those cigarette butts are not going anywhere <laughs> um, except a garbage can, but to put them in the garbage can before there's a message to the community and, and, and that message is to come and look and see and hear and learn and participate, um, it does make an impact. It, it doesn't necessarily change <laughs> or solve a problem, but it makes an impact on us, I think, uh, intellectually, emotionally, viscerally, and helps to continue to overcome or at least 
um, improve the mental stress that comes along with all of this too, in terms of what, what what's our future? Well, what's our present? What are we doing in our present? And hopefully that will. Mm -hmm. Open for questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up sort of on what Mitch was talking about and sort of Aaron with art uh, in industrial revolution and history. Um, one of the things that I teach is a survey of art, <clears throat> and we start like 40,000 BC. And when we look at cave paintings and we look at um, what happens with human beings is at one point we became self-aware. And at that point, that self-awareness led us to distinctly separate ourselves from the animal and natural world. And I think that, yes, the industrial revolution and the plastics, but I just like to think or open this up for thought is that at some point then, when we separated ourselves from the natural world, we put ourselves on a trajectory to mm -hmm. um, make our lives more comfortable, make our lives more successful mm -hmm. at the expense often of the natural world. And that's what led ultimately to the industrial revolution. So. I think that thinking about the nature of human is important and that it's it needs to be thought differently because uh, it's really about consumption right. and, and what we need to have to be comfortable that is really at the crux here in a way. Yeah, I have, I have a couple of things to add to that. And, and part of what I was thinking about for my presentation was going back to the origins of humans 300,000 years ago. And you're right, I mean, uh, the human footprint on the from the planet began then, um, uh, in terms of um, hunter gatherers, right? Uh, foraging, uh, using fire to clear areas, you know, uh, uh, that type of thing. Um, and then you get up to the uh, the, uh, the agricultural revolution, right? Which is a massive impact on the environment. And then I, I've read some pieces that, of uh, anthropology and archaeology that call humans. Uh, the, the ultimate invasive species, right? Because unlike most species, humans don't seem to be constrained by a habitat, right? They can go anywhere. They started in Africa and they spread everywhere around the whole world, right? You know, and so, yeah, there's something about human nature, I think, that needs to be thought about you know, as part of the equation and not necessarily just the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, I I do think that idea of having maybe a little bit more of sort of a, a reverence for nature or or maybe just to really be thinking of that we are part of nature and we're not separate so if we're hurting the environment we're hurting ourselves and we're uh, you know poisoning our own water and we're you know destroying yeah. our own sort of natural resources um the other thing though that chris you're making me think of is uh and i know you could have a lot more you could probably say but um i just know that uh, professor longwell uh has given lectures about this idea that comes from Japan, that's this idea of wabi-sabi. And it's this sort of aesthetic, and there's different ways to think about it and talk about it. Sometimes it's this aesthetic of things being sort of imperfect. And you know, if you're throwing a, a pot on the wheel, making it out of clay, it might be a little bit wobbly or a little bit off-center or a little bit imperfect in some way. Um, but I think that aesthetic is also this idea of rather than think like you want to have, you know, if you break something that it's garbage and that you have to throw it away, it's the idea that if you fix it and can still use it, it actually becomes a more beautiful thing, right? So I think that's an example of how you can shift your mindset to rather than feel like you have to buy into that idea of, of consumption, 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 right? Even if people are fixing things, that still is uh, a type of a economy, right? There's you still people are having work it's not like you're saying, you know, we shouldn't have work, we shouldn't be buying things, we shouldn't be doing anything, uh, but it's just a little bit of a different idea than constant, you know, single use kind of consumption. Anchor spaces and tinker labs are, as we all know, are, are have been experiencing a resurgence. And again, it's not to the exclusion of new, new you know, innovation, but yeah, it does show an appreciation for, and I think oftentimes an intention to, reuse repair repair and uh and also uh, enjoy and feel good uh again it's a wellness too 
right? That, that as we do as we do these things, we are feeling better about where we are and what we are putting out into the world as creatives too, um, and helping others feel good about that. I think that's part of a creation a creation economy, which we very much support yeah. in this community. So, um, and it, for communities of Elmira, we often think we're modeling for the youth, right? But oftentimes, and more times now than not, it's the youth who are modeling for those who are studying programs and who are creating uh, administrative like, exhibitions and, and, and writing grants and things like that. Um, uh, but we often at Community Arts of Elmira partner with events around town. And yes, larger um, action steps you can take to reuse, reduce, and upcycle. But we work with Elmira College and usually a senior or a junior will create a watercolor sketch. And we take that out into the uh, community and the children have uh, watercolor. We do not dump in the lawn. People might think, oh, that's it's not really toxic. It's okay. Like, no, it's not okay. The community is watching you. You should do it for obviously to do it for the right right reasons to respect nature. But the community is watching, and we are models. We are teachers, and what we do, whether we are have the have the title or label of a teacher or not. And so we take extra extra buckets with us, and we dump the water in the buckets, and we haul it back to community arts and dispose of that safely. I mean, no no action is too small. I'll repeat, we don't allow balloons at Community Arts of Elmira because some person said to me, well, now they make balloons that balloons that are biodegradable. And I said, they're not biodegradable for four to 10 years. Like they're still around for four to 10 years and no, no, nothing is truly in, in terms of that ever going to, again, disappear. So small things like that, it doesn't make you popular, but you would, you would, you would it, in, in the, in the short run, but in the long run, it compels people to be more creative and what they want their, the, you know, when you're celebrating a birthday or an anniversary or a wedding, what is it in the environment that you're creating that you're celebrating? You're celebrating at the expense of the earth. And we are, again, to go back to the idea that we are one. So small steps can make tremendous impact. I would love to hear if other people have more questions. Um, I was wondering, uh, just to, maybe it's a, to just a, a comment and then a question for the panel. Um, I just want to kind of complicate things by just pointing out that the Industrial Revolution, while it's maybe kind of we're kind of painting this as this horrific event that occurred, <laughs> that the Industrial Revolution at the same time pretty much eliminated famine uh, across the entire world, right? Um, and if famine occurs now, it's because of political reasons, not because of we're dependent on the agricultural cycle, which was a common occurrence across the globe, right before the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. But also with the Industrial Revolution comes the rise of capitalism in corporations, right? And I want to ask you as a panel, however, at least to art or science fiction, you've mentioned this personal pronoun a lot, we. And how much is the consumer, the individual consumer, responsible for the problem? And how much is the problem of corporations, right? In other words, if we're really going to kind of solve this problem, um, who's the, is it the corporations or is it the individual that needs to kind of uh, get their act together, right? I mean, while getting rid of Mylar balloons at the community arts might be a really wonderful thing, mm -hmm. um, how much is that an impact compared to industrial pollution and things like that? Yeah, and um, God, there's a lot there that I could piggyback on, but I guess, uh, near the end of your question so i think this the stuff that i'm reading talks about the fossil fuel industry the um, the dark money and politics that is now perfectly legal because of the citizens united supreme court decision about 10 years or so um our government is bought and sold by the people people that profit the most off of the fossil fuel economy that we have, right? And so there's your nexus, right? The government, uh, corporations, you know, and the fossil fuel economy that is destroying the earth. Um, and uh, I don't know how individuals can affect change governmentally, you know, when 
if you look at the track record, I was looking at some data sets the other day. Most people have the sense that the government doesn't do anything, but you need a, you need criteria to evaluate that. If you evaluate the criteria from a people's perspective, it's not doing anything most of the time for the people. But if you evaluate it against the 1% and the 10%, the corporations, mm -hmm. they're doing stuff for them all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, they're winning at a time when most of us are losing. Um, and so I think part of the solution to the climate problem is addressing the ineffectiveness of our government for most of us. And I don't know how you do that, but I'm, this is a, a related thing here. I'm expecting, I guess I'm the doom and gloom guy here on the panel, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'm expecting eco-terrorism is what I'm expecting. You know, uh, I think we're going to see it in the next five to 10 years where people are going to start panicking and feeling like, hey, nobody's doing anything. It's time that we strike, right? Uh, there was a book that just came out here in the last five years, and I think they made a, a movie about it. You know, it, it was uh, blanking on the name of it. It was something uh, like how to bomb uh, an oil field or something like that, or how to bomb a, a pipeline. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and uh, how to guide, you know, to be an eco terrorist. Um, so um, that's. It is a huge problem, but you're right. You have to factor in corporations. You have to factor in the government uh, into that equation. But we are too. We are consuming what they are producing. Yeah. So again, it, my opinion, it's just it's both and. You know, we've seen we've seen people move against other justice issues and to not feel hopeless um to believe that we each can do something and to find that source where you can do something will it, will it fix it will it make is it a solution but day to day um you know it's that look to your left, look to your right, go back to your communities, take back what you have learned here, what your passion is, what your drive is, what your commitment is to your communities and find larger groups. But the wellness, even more so, <laughs> the need to feel the wellness every day of what you do matters. I was valid too, in terms of raising the awareness of that consumption. Right, Lane. I, I was going to say, uh, yeah, I think it's, I don't think it's a very black and white kind of issue. I mean, um, if we say rather than corporations, just institutions, I mean, Elmira College is an institution, right? And we're having this day to try to raise awareness and to try to encourage uh, a change, whether it's in activity or in thought of students and people in our community. Um, even like the thing that I had sort of talked about of, you know, governmental or not-for-profit kinds of organizations having things like nature preserves and national parks and state forests and things like that. Uh, I think those are organizations that are doing real good and making real efforts that um, maybe are not a big enough of a difference to solve the problem is maybe kind of to Mitch's point. Um, but I don't think it's just the fact that anything that is a group, right, that it's a corporation or it's an institution that that is inherently bad. Um, and even this idea of um, capitalism and this idea that capitalism leads to this kind of consum consumerist culture, I think there is a lot of truth to that. But as I was sort of saying before, I think there does exist a possibility for uh, a capitalist economy that isn't so rooted in, uh, you know, sort of say, like I said, single use, say single use plastics, as an example, or in, uh, you know, coal and gasoline, you know, energy, um, or other kinds of fossil fuels like that. So yeah. I think it's, it's complicated. I don't think it's just that something that's a corporation is inherently bad or inherently evil. Because um, I think, you know, we can try to make individual changes, but I think it's only as a large group that if I'm going to say that word, we, you know, the people that uh, think that these are, are real issues and real problems that should be addressed, that it's those of us that are that we um, that need to uh, 
work together to, to mm -hmm. sort of try to achieve those goals. Yeah, to build on that, there's, there's nothing inherently wrong with corporations or capitalism, but the problem with them is they become they become increasingly deregulated, and uh, and the failure of our government, you know, to put adequate checks on them. So you've not only seen the increasing power and uh, accumulation of wealth. Uh, if you look at um, wealth inequality, not just income inequality, but wealth inequality, it's been spiking like crazy since the 70s. And so uh, most people hardly own any wealth. The top 10% own practically everything. And I don't know if you noticed during the, the pandemic, there was a point in the middle of the pandemic in 2020 when people were uh, uh, worrying about their jobs and their livelihood. Most people, you know, they were being asked to stay home. They were getting occasional checks from the government. And meanwhile, the stock market was going through the roof, right? The stock market was going through the roof when the majority of people are worrying about their, you know, uh, paying next month's bills. Um, but if you look at the story of the last 40 years in the United States, there's been increasingly deregulation of government, uh, of corporations. Corporations are people. They have the power. The they have free speech. They have constitutional rights. Corporations do. Um, and so, what we really need, if we were able to regulate uh, the economy and make it serve the planet and the society, rather than serving corporate interests and shareholders and maximizing power, you know, the the goal of capitalism is growth. We can't have perennial growth unchecked, right? Uh, and so the short-term quarter profits and all this other kinds of stuff. So we need government intervention at a time, right, when most of our politicians are screaming that we should have no government intervention. Government intervention is bad. And why is that? Because it's been profitable for uh, the top 10% of the country for the last 40 years. But so more regulation is what's needed if we're going to have a sustainable economy. That's what we really need. And to add more people who are we, mm -hmm. <laughs> perhaps also need to find their way, find their support, work in larger groups, and become. Right. So that might seem super idealistic, <laughs> um, but at the same time, why can't it be realistic too? Why can't it be both and? And then capitalism, corporation, then truly reflects more of the relationship between the human, even though it is the ent and it is the entity as well as the nature and um, the culture. Let's not forget we haven't talked too much about that word today, but um, and that's hope, right? But that's also movement. I feel for hope to occur and to be present. There's hope. Just a quick time check. There's five more minutes left. <laughs> so, um, but there's any other questions? Yeah, any other questions or comments? Yeah. So as it relates to the role of a consumer dictating what the demand side of a capitalist economy and the democratic voter determining what the representatives are pushing for, what do you think about the role of art and media in the shaping of the public mind and perception on these ideas? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. I, I think, um, I mean, immediately before you said art and media shaping that, I was thinking education, right? I think is really important that people are, are aware of and thinking of these kinds of issues and these kinds of concerns. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I think you're leading a little bit with your question that I think it's, it's obvious that there is, I think, some... Uh, maybe not responsibility, but certainly an ability of uh, art and media to be able to inform people and, and shape public opinions and, um, yeah, to kind of potentially show people that, you know, um, you know, I think there are, for example, TV shows where it, it kind of is so much about material culture and materialism, and it just feels like, oh, this is the kind of life, right? This is kind of giving culturally us a, a model of this is, yeah. you know, if you're watching those kinds of things, that this is how you're supposed to live. Um, so, yeah, I think there is definitely other other kinds of things you can show. I'm just even kind of thinking of like, um, as a kid, uh, you know, I would watch um, science programs, NOVA, you know, things on um, 
public, you know, public broadcasting service kind of TV stations that would really tell you about like these are real issues and and this is sort of a, a, a science of it, right? It's not necessarily um, something that's sort of overly dogmatic. It's just kind of producing, you know, or educating uh, people in a way. So, yeah, I mean, I think it can be difficult to do something that's both going to make money and be entertaining, but that is also going to promote those ideas. But I, I think there is a, definitely an ability of uh, media to impact those things. And I think Maybe. art can do that through different mediums too. So uh, you're not speaking the facts, not telling the facts, but showing the facts. Um, the um, the plankton to blue whales um, can ingest plastic quote was actually uh, written on the side of a five foot um, plastic um, a dolphin that from the plastic that Donnie, uh, that um, Pani had uh, excavated <laughs> from the ocean on several of her trips. And it was interactive. There was a bicycle pedal and you could turn it and it would light up from lights, Christmas lights found in the ocean and the sand pit, everything you can imagine. And so you were you were literally interacting with the plastic dolphin and, and learning these statistics in a very interactive tactile, which changed at least offered an, an alternative to um, being told you were being shown. And I think that the, the media and the art can show um, with imagination. Um, and again, it's not as overwhelming to people. They're more receptive to it because they're not, um, the, I think there's an important aspect of doom and gloom to things. I, it, it, that, that, that's a, that can be a motivator and that's okay, but there also then has to be a level of how can I live with this on a daily basis and it, can, and it, it doesn't deplete me more than what's happening in terms of climate change. So I think art can present that truth, right? Artists speak truth to power, but yet also, especially in a community and collaborative settings and exhibitions and classes, teaching people can happen in not very non-traditional ways too, that are a, um, more receptive, people are receptive. Yeah, I know you had a question. I just wanted us to try to get to the answer. I just, so it seems like there is a lot of multiple cultural issues that Impressive with climate change, it's not just environmental issue. So, do you feel like there's a sense of accountability that needs to be had? So, that like one of the ways that we can help change everything is by making sure everybody takes accountability for their impacts, or is it just more of a, a accountability side of corporate instead of just Yeah, I, th I think it has to come from the ground up, you know, and uh, uh, the corporations aren't going to change their ways. And in fact, they want more. <laughs> they're not satisfied with what they have. They're they're charting for more growth and uh, more tax cuts, you know, and everything else. And so it's got to be a, a groundswell, you know, it's got to be an uprising of the people. Uh, rates. Yeah. Well, and I think they will change their way if there is, if the path forward presented for them is that, you know, there's, you know, for example, if, um, say electric cars do become some part of that mm -hmm. solution, you know, so, um, but I was going to say too, I, I think for Jax, you, I'm thinking kind of more on a personal level. I just remember I had, um, and I won't name any names, but maybe I shouldn't even say this. I'm sort of ratting out one of my students. I had a student a few years ago who's since graduated. Um, and I remember, you know, this was a student who I think in many ways was very engaged with this kind of, uh, at least sort of liked to present themselves as being engaged with this kind of lifestyle that we're talking about of like, um, you know, all of my clothing is thrifted and I'm really doing something great for the environment and I'm doing these sort of certain steps. And then um, I remember I took out my iPhone, which was, you know, six years old or something at that point. And the student said like, oh, I can't believe you have such an old iPhone. Like that's so embarrassing. <laughs> And this student, it, you know, turned out, got a new iPhone every single year that it came out. So it's that thing that you can sort of present yourself as if I am helping the environment by buying thrifted clothing instead of brand new clothing. Um, but I do think there is a difference between trying to make yourself look like that's what you're doing versus something that you are actually doing truthfully for yourself or in a kind of an honest way. 
Um, and yeah, I don't know how that how you can be accountable sort of on that level, except to say that you know you guys know what you're doing, I think. Um, so you know, um, and you know you know each other. Um, but yeah, I do think that's a, a difficult thing. So I appreciate that. Um, we're out of time. Um, if you have questions for the panelists, ask questions. There's stuff out there. Go check it out. One thing after another. About like if I gave you a for real because she Oh, if it's being finished around, so it's it be it should be clear. Maybe it's on a. I remember seeing it there last. I don't really even that young. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Also, also, also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I think I got the on Yes. Yeah, I just